The Local Youth Worker is a podcast brought to you by Reformed Youth Ministries. Since 1972, RYM has sought to reach and equip youth for Christ. And this podcast seeks to reach and equip those parents and youth workers who share that same desire. For more information on our student conferences, youth leader training, or resources, visit rym.org. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Local Youth Worker, a podcast brought to you by Reformed Youth Ministries. I'm your host, John Pirrett. Uh, This is episode 361, and I'm here with Kurt Cooper. Kurt, how's it going? Hey, John. Uh, A little bit later in our Rested Development segment, we will have Dr. Kelly Capick on with us. He is a professor at Covenant College, and he's the author of You're Only Human. Um, and several other titles, but we'll be talking to him a little bit about that and the kind of rest and work balance that we're continuing to have. Um, at the time of this recording, we don't have our main segment set up, so I cannot give you a, a preview for that. But right now I'm here with Kurt talking about essentials of a youth retreat. Uh, Kurt, what do you think an essential of a youth retreat is? Sure. Okay. Well, I thought it was something else when you first asked me this question, and then I asked you to preview me what other people had said. And I realized that I was off a little bit, which is okay, fine. Stop. What, what were you thinking? Let's go ahead and hear. Well, I'm going to go with my original. Okay, right? Okay. So I'm not changing it now that I've heard because I'm not wishy-washy. I have a backbone of steel, John. But, <laughs> That's true. Uh, we, we all know that. I'm going to stand firm in my convictions. Now, I said uh, decks of cards. Oh, right? yeah. Now, it, this is why I think you should, it's an essential for a youth retreat. I'm glossing over the obvious things like a guitar or a Bible or, you know, the things that, w- um, that you know, are going to be at, at, at every youth retreat. But you need to bring decks of cards, and here's why. First of all, on our retreats, a lot of our retreats, we don't allow our students to take their phones. So... I find that most of our students are used to passing their time by just endlessly scrolling through social media or playing, you know, a game on their phone. And when they don't have that, they're going to look for something to do. Um, And one really good social interaction, you know, that you can have is teaching people how to play card games. Um, There are a bunch of different ones that we play in our youth group. Some of them have a higher barrier to entry and, you know, you have to have been a while to be able to really play those. And others of them, anyone can play, you know, at any time and, and, and feel and it can be kind of like a initiation or, or a welcoming kind of thing to do. Plus, you do card tricks. Typically, you know, you got junior high boys who swear they know a really good card trick. They all know the same one. Um, <laughs> so uh, but you can do a couple of card tricks if, or, or let someone do card tricks um, and you can use them to play some other games, too. Um, you know, we play games where you have to pass out cards for other you know, purposes besides just, you know, your classic card game. So I would say pretty useful to have several decks of cards. And, you know, if you have a bunch of them, you can have different people playing different games. So if someone wants to play something more intense or whatever, um, they can break off and do that. Uh, So pretty useful tool to bring on a trip, especially if there are no phones on the trip. Yeah. Kurt, I, lo- I love this answer. Um, and it's just, it's so cool to me to think. Of course of- you do, John. <laughs> it was a great answer. It's it, like, it, it goes without saying. I shouldn't, I don't even know. It's, this is not a pride thing. I just want to meet the person that's like, terrible idea. Cards <laughs> do not belong on youth retreat. <laughs> well, just think of how long, I mean, that they've withstood the test of time, right? I mean, that they're still around. People are still using decks of cards. They're still playing games, even with electronic devices, all kinds of things. Um, it's so cool to, to just know that these, you know, are still making rounds on youth retreats. And you have conversations over cards. Yes. Right. Good. Um, Good. You know, you're all circled around, you know, if you're playing, you know, where you've got to draw from somewhere or something, you're all circling around and you're talking about whatever the guy I was talking about or what's going on in people's lives or, you know, the silly thing that the other guy did or, you know, whatever it is. So it's a naturally it it fosters conversation. Um, yeah. And I'll, I find also, I'll just add that um, a lot of boys, you know, even when they're young, um, boys need, in order to have a conversation, in order to have relationship, boys need an objective, right? And cards provides an objective for that, right? Uh, 
you know, boys don't play uh, relational games like house or doctor. Uh, boys play, you know, cowboys and Indians or cops and robbers or, you know, um, or they play good guys and bad guys, superheroes and villains or tag or, you know. And so uh, just if you're thinking about ministering to boys in particular, because a, a lot of our girls are ministry, love to play cards, too. But boys need that. And sometimes a boy will kind of come out of his shell a little bit if you give him, you know, something to do while, you know while talking. Yeah. Now that, that's, a, that's a great answer. And, and we actually splurged recently and got some waterproof cards. Um, I don't know if you've gotten a waterproof deck before. Um, it's really nice, especially like you're taking on retreats, somebody's going to spill something, or if you go to, you know, RYM Florida, there's a lot of water around. Um, so yeah, those can, can come in handy. Uh, just real quick. What is your favorite, favorite go-to card game with students? I've got a lot of answers for that. But first, I've heard, I just want to say why waterproof cars might be a good investment is I've heard 70% of the world is water. So, you know, oh, really? Anyway. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> okay. Go, go to card games. Um, there are two that kind of dominate our youth group from time to time. Uh, one is called NERTS, N E R T Z. Uh, you can buy, uh, you can look that up if you want. It's a great game. It's a fast paced game. Um, not great for beginners. Uh, you're going to get destroyed um, at the beginning. That's good. You know, you learn some humility and then, you, yeah. you know, are motivated. And then we play a game called King Mao, uh, which is uh, a game that I love because uh, you get to make up your own rules if you win a hand. Um, but you don't tell anyone. They just have to figure it out on your own. We actually played the other night at our youth group, and a girl uh, a girl made up a, a, a rule that every time you played the, a four, you had to say, mmm, chicken. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I think it's an old vine or something. But there's a lot of good inside jokes that, uh, that come from King Mal. Uh, frustrating for beginners, but also, yeah. you know – it's hilarious also in a funny way. So, um, yeah, those are two games that people really get into, uh, in our youth group. Well, those are some, some good ones, Kurt. Um, look, I just want to remind our listeners to check out the show notes. We're putting some, some content in there. Um, something what we're adding is our discipleship guide. Um, we produced that about five years ago, but it's something I'd kind of forgotten about. And a parent came up to me recently talking about, how helpful that was. And um, also our conversation with Jared Kennedy reminded me about just how helpful that can be for parents. Um, so be sure to check that out in the show notes as well as some of our top 10 lists. Uh, for now, here's Dr. Uh, Kelly Capick. Dr. Capick, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. This is exciting. Yeah, looking looking forward to getting into this conversation with you. Uh, Linda, it's also good to have you with us as well. Yeah, good to be here to help out. And um, let me just go ahead and ask you this, Dr. Capic, off the cuff. I mean, we were talking Chattanooga right before mm. recording. What's your favorite pizza place in Chattanooga? Oh, that's... Um, <laughs> put, you on the, put you on the spot. You weren't ready for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um. That's difficult because it kind of goes around and there's some specialty pizzas. Uh, there's one on Maine that's quite good. But honestly, there's something um, probably more sentimental than taste buds that says Mr. T's at the base of the mountain because I like mm. supporting the local business. But there are better pizzas than Mr. T's. But uh, there's something about that that I that's sentimental for various reasons. So. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, as we were sharing pre-recording, I, I worked at Alpine Camp and we definitely went to Mr. T's. <laughs> oh, I, I bet. So I bet. Yeah. That's a great place. Um, well, look, we, we've started this new segment entitled Rested Development, and uh, your newest book entitled You're Only Human, How Your Limits Reflect God's Design and Why That's Good News, um, has so much to say about what we're discussing in this segment and, and trying to discuss as we're thinking about, you know, this rest and work balance. Um, and so I, I'm always fascinated to find out just kind of the origins of a book. Um, how did you stumble into this uh, through your reading, through your writing, through your, your teaching? Um, what was it about this subject that just kind of um, sparked an interest for you? Yeah, so it, I'll try and put it as briefly as possible. There's, there's really two sides. There's a, a very personal and then there's a more kind of theological side. Uh, and this is something I've been wrestling with and thinking about for, for literally 20 years. Um, the more personal side 
is uh, I'll make this as brief as I can. But my wife and I got married in 1993. And in 2008, she got cancer. And we still had young children because we were married nine years before we had children. And she recovered from cancer and was declared cancer free after surgeries. And um, but then in 2010, developed a pretty serious chronic pain fatigue. And we've been dealing with that every day, every day to this day, she still deals with that. Um, never a day without without pain and fatigue. Mm -hmm. And so part of it was and, and I it's a longer story, but I ended up writing a book called Embodied Hope, a reflection on pain and suffering. But part of that whole process was Tabitha and I are both, you know, pretty driven people. We liked, you know, that kind of, and it was, it, I don't know if it's stumble or you just get smacked with your limits. Hmm. And we kept having to cut out more and more. And we thought, well, we've cut out enough. And then the reality is we hadn't, and we were still doing too much and worn out and, um, and just, she couldn't. And so we had to rethink everything. And so writing on reflection and pain and lament and thinking through that actually prepared me to finally be able to speak more thoughtfully about the goodness of being a creature. And part of what I become, I've become concerned with is that we've confused the limits of how much we can do and how much we can be with sin. The short way of saying that is I think we've confused finitude and sin. And so um, this book, You're Only Human, is, is trying to celebrate the goodness of being a creature and why it's okay. And so the, the theological side that drove me to this is I'm very interested in the full humanity of Jesus and he's fully human and that there's nothing sinful in being fully human. And also the goodness of creation. I think um, for the last you know 100 years or so, Christians have often reduced the idea, the importance of creation to when did God create the earth and how did he do it? And although those are legitimate discussions, I would argue they're not even the most important. And things like the fact that we, we are made creatures and what is the goodness of being a creature who's dependent and only has, and has these limits. So anyways, th that gives you a taste of some of the things I've been that drove me to it. Yeah, no, that's fascinating to hear. And I know something that, that I've heard you share as well and something you, you say in your book is just um, so so many times you, you would you said you would go to bed at night and just all the guilt would kind of come up from all yeah. the things you didn't do in the day. I, I'd love for you just to, to talk about that a little bit and maybe as well as what, what are some of the, the, the common guilt that, that you think people kind of wrestle with? Um, yeah, very, no, very thank you. Yeah, thanks for asking that. I, that, that might be helpful for folks. So when I would go and still I put my head on the pillow at night and like many people, you kind of have the flood of thoughts about your day, about your life. And I noticed how often when I would pay attention, just kind of waves of guilt and shame would come over me. And I, I'm a reformed theologian, so I think sin's real. I think we need to take it seriously. And if, if as you lay in bed and you're brought to mind, you know, ways you've been cruel to people or greedy um, or self-absorbed. I think we need to repent of that and rest in the grace of Christ. And amen, that's great. But actually what surprised me is how often that guilt and shame wasn't necessarily because of those things. It was when I looked at it, it was really, I felt guilt and shame that I didn't do more in my day, that I didn't get more done, that I wasn't more. <laughs> and then I've started to ask as a theologian, wait a minute, do I need to feel guilt and shame about all those things? And actually, to put it in a different way, I think we tend, we don't actually tend to ask for God's forgiveness for not getting more done, but we feel the guilt and shame about it. And I'm trying to argue, rather than asking for forgiveness that we didn't get more done, I think often a lot of us need to ask forgiveness that we ever thought we could or should do it all. Mm -hmm. And that is just our discomfort with being fully human. Yeah, that, that's good. Um, I love how you said that. Re repenting over the fact that we actually thought that, that we could get it all done. I um, mean, one of the questions, just to follow up to maybe it will help people, is even if there were no sin or fall, did Adam and Eve, did, did, did being a human creature have limits to it? Like, did they always know everything? Could they be everywhere? Did they have inexhaustible energy? All No, no, no. 
part of being a creature is being finite. So that's not bad. That's a good thing. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's good. Linda, I'd love for you to jump in as well. Yeah. So it sounds like, uh, kind of what you're getting at is this idea that, you know, we talk about the need to leave work at work or have Mm. a good like work life balance. And instead of framing it just in those ways, it sounds like you're saying like, let's frame the conversation in terms of we need to recognize our creatureliness yes, and our limits, right? Yeah. Like talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, no, I love that question. And, and I probably need to think and write more about that because, you know, we all talk about these work-life balances and I don't even know what in the world that means, to be honest. I think <laughs> yeah. it's, you know, most of them are like, you know, what, try. it's not a pie. You can't divide it. Even this idea that we use our time well and that's part of the myth like we are in control of time and we're using it and it's kind of this ben franklin ben franklin is the one who said time is money and christians have just taken that and baptized it without realizing it Hmm. and it's not that we think we're trying to get financial benefit from every minute that's not what i mean it's but we think you better be productive and efficient with every minute And one of the big arguments I'm making in the book is, and I personally love productivity and efficiency, but the good, you know, a a significant, well, here's the argument in the book. When you make productivity and efficiency your highest values rather than love, it distorts everything. And that's what's happening is we've made productivity and efficiency the highest values. And so we judge our lives constantly by those outputs. And the problem is, though we don't tend to think about it, very few things are as inefficient as love, <laughs> right? Whether you're, you're trying to love a puppy or a baby or a spouse or a friend or an enemy, none of it goes smoothly. None of it's efficient. None of it's very productive. Mm-hmm. And um, so this is a, this is a problem. That, that, yeah, that's so true. And, and as you just said, okay, you don't know what a work life balance looks like. Looks like. Could, could you dig into that a little bit more? Because I, I'm with you. It's so confusing. And yeah, just I'd love to. Well, love I mean, even even more. when we think about, you know, 40 hours a week of work and da, da, da. I'm not totally for or against any of that. But we just have, like, where is that coming from? Right. <laughs> so let, let me let me give you an, another example of time part of what was really fun and interesting in the research for this that i didn't anticipate is studying clocks the history of clocks and time and just to give you a little taste of that so scholars will talk about a distinction between what they'll call contextual time and non-contextual time and can uh we basically in the modern western world live in non-contextual time And what that means is because of technology, because of things like electricity, where at 11 o'clock at night, you can turn on the lights, you can open up your laptop and it's, it's staring at you. We're like, well, it's 11 PM and I have an hour of work, quote unquote, work to do. So I should do it. But the reality is we're denying all of these other things. Whereas in other cultures and in the history of the world, the reality is it's dark outside. Your body chemistry is changing, right? There are different seasons in the year. There's a reason why sometimes of year when it's harvest, you're working incredibly long hours. And at other times, you're actually working much, much less. There are just those different se- seasons and rhythms. But when we've, because of, you know, in tech, I'm not anti-technology, but because of these things, we've lost our ability to distinguish. So then we're like a work-life balance. We think you should always be able to do something. And so I'm not just trying to pick on employment or work hours. I'm just saying, how do we use our time, quote unquote, use our time? How do we think about our time? Um, We need to grow more comfortable with silence, with rest, with rhythm. And so it's not even just about how many hours do you work, how many, but we fill up every moment with staring at our phone because we're so uncomfortable, right? There's something that we should be doing. So that's, that's part of what I mean is I'm not trying to just argue for a 35 hour week or 40 or 50 hour week. It's not that it's, we need to reconceive of our relationship as creatures to the rest of creation and freely and happily live in those rhythms. 
That's really good. Uh, Linda, I don't want to keep talking. Did, did you have something? Because I, I had something. Sure. Like yeah. As a follow-up to that. So I, I think it was a CT article where you were interviewed about the book that I saw you say this, what if we stopped thinking of life as to-dos mm. and started thinking of it as relationships? Mm. And it was just one of those lines that I was like, okay, wow. Uh, explain that more and then tell me like, how do I actually do that if I'm a really task oriented <laughs> person? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and this comes from the reason why I can write that is I'm someone who loves it. Well, I don't know. I love hate, but I do to do list all the time. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and the truth is in a healthy to do list, there's a recognition that these are related to relationships. Right. Um, but the sign is how do I, how do I think of interacting with people? Do I, uh, one of the signs is, do I find, no matter if I have a smiling face at others um, or whatever, is there rage in my soul when people get in my way, when I'm trying to mm. quote unquote, get stuff mm. done? That's a, that's a sign that I've made to do's and efficiency and productivity more important than love. I'm not against trying to create space for creativity, for concentration, for focus, but it does start to look like people are to do's rather than people are people. And so I really think God made us as creatures to be in communion with him, neighbors, even the earth. And so do the to do's, I, I test away is do the to do's foster those three relationships or do they hinder them? And I think you can really foster a relationship with God and neighbor by genuinely doing your work and concentrating. And it doesn't mean that you just, you know, I guess we don't really have water coolers that much anymore, but you know, <laughs> it, I don't mean that that to do what I'm saying, it, you're, you're constantly just hanging out with people. Um, but in the book, the way I would talk about it is the test case is, can you be fully present with people? And, and if we find being present with God, and being fully present with others difficult, that's probably a sign that the to-do list is ruling us rather than helping us, if that helps at all. Mm. Yeah, Dr. Capic, I'm so glad we've got more time with you. Um, I know it's time to, to go to our next segment, um, but I'm glad we've got the next two weeks uh, to talk to you. So thank you for this. Hey everybody, welcome back. I am here with Linda Oliver and Scott Bird. How's it going? Linda first and then Scott. <laughs> Doing Doing good well. too. <laughs> We're off to a great start. Um, that's all my fault. Um, good to see y'all. <laughs> so look, I actually recorded um, a, an essential of a youth retreat with Kurt and he brought up uh, playing cards that that was his essential uh, which I thought was was a great essential and just all the different things you can do with it. And from that, I thought, you know what, let's let's talk about games a little bit more. Um, Scott and Linda, you, you help out with some of the behind the scenes of the the podcast. And I know we've talked about that a little bit of, hey, let's let's have some some time to talk a little bit more about games. Um, so I just figured we, we'd jump into this. Uh, Scott, I know you're well prepared for this. Um, Linda, you as well. Very. Yeah, as always. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. Um, how about Scott? Let's do, let's start with you. And then Linda, uh, Scott, do you play games in your youth ministry? Uh, we, we, we don't play games on uh, Wednesday nights, which is our large group. Uh, so we don't do that. We did at one time and uh, our student, mostly our senior high guys just did not enjoy it. Uh, and so we stopped doing it and haven't done it for years. Um, and so we don't play on, on Wednesday nights. Uh, we do play on retreats and things. We have organized games that we do. Um, and then, I mean, like Kurt said, you know, bringing cards, like our, our guys love to play poker. And so on Wednesday nights, they'll bring a <laughs> poker set and, uh, you know, play not for money or anything. Cigars. <laughs> yeah. cigars yeah. And... But we oh. usually do try to, make make it where like the the first person out has to do something terrible you know just so you get a little skin in the game yeah. um so that's kind of the extent of it is mostly it's just confined to retreats and um trips and things like that 
Mm-hmm. So yeah, when you hear poker, yeah, both of you, like I always picture cigars and then those green visors, you know, like somebody, do, do y'all picture that? Or is that just me? No, I don't, I do not. <laughs> you will now, Scott. Um, okay, Linda, what, what about you guys? Do, do y'all play games in your youth group? Yeah. So, I mean, there's a few different ways I could like conceptualize this. Cause like number one, there's times when students are here, um, and we just kind of like impromptu play games with them, you know, so whether it's like fellowship time at the beginning of a program or because we have a Christian school here, sometimes students will come visit us during their lunch period and they'll just play ping pong or um, like foosball or something like that with us. Um, so we, we have stuff like that that we'll do with students. But then in terms of organized games, um, like if we're running our regular Sunday evening programs with students, we are likely to do games with both the middle school and the high school students. Sometimes the high school students, um, we have like a smaller crowd these days. And sometimes it's a matter of just kind of reading the room and being like, you know what, like, I feel like we're okay just continuing our conversation that we're having and like taking more time to eat our dinner before we go into small groups. And so I don't do the game sometimes. Um, but yeah, otherwise I try to do some sort of game that everyone is participating in. Yeah, part of it for us, I think, too, is that, you know, time constraint, we just, mm-hmm. we're, we have like, I think it's an hour and 15 minutes officially, you know, when right. students are there. And so by the time you eat, do announcements, worship, have a mm-hmm. lesson, there's just not a whole lot of time to to bring games in. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, some people don't think about, uh, you know, if you're not doing youth ministry all the time, the, the transition in between each of those Yes. To, to move, <laughs> you know, however many teenagers you have, it takes, you know, several minutes for sure. Um, so, yeah, when, when I was doing student ministry, we had, you know, we, we'd have kind of open gym at the beginning on Wednesday night before our small groups and worship, all that began. Um, not saying we're not worshiping during our recreation. We can talk about some of that in a minute, uh, just for those listening out there. Um, and then there was always uh, Sunday. Sunday afternoon was basically just fellowship time and games. Um, before I, I came on staff, kind of inherited this in the schedule that you know someone thought, okay, they had Sunday school in the morning. They had Sunday morning worship. Uh, they have Sunday evening worship. So let's just kind of have some fellowship and, and game time. Um, so, yeah, we, we had one kind of program during the week that was just kind of solely fellowship and games. Um, what, what about some theological reasons uh, for, for playing games? Um, we, we've probably shared some of these. I know we've kind of dipped into this a little bit, even in our essentials of, of a youth retreat, um, maybe even essentials of a youth room as well. Um, just some of those ideas. Uh, Linda, do you want to kick us off on that with some theological reasons? Sure. Um, I think that, you know, it, it makes sense for us to be doing games because there's, there's an aspect where you're teaching the students like, Hey, God created a world in which there is fun. Um, and he created us in a way where we, um, we exist in bodies that are meant to do physical things. Um, I just think that that's increasingly a part of sort of the theological conversations these days is, um, in the, I don't know, like wider Christian world, Mm -hmm. like the importance of our bodies and, um, like to, to take that seriously, I think students need to not just come in, sit down. They need to do something with their bodies too, in order to be able to engage with us well some. Um, and so I, I think those are all kind of aspects of it, but then it also is, um, you know, I, I just care so much about the community that we're building, um, mm-hmm. which I think you can make a lot of theological arguments about, you know, like we want it to be a place where students feel known and connected to others. And a lot of that can happen through games where they're on teams together, or it just kind of breaks down barriers in ways um, that you can create these shared memories, um, shared teamwork, maybe even kind of break um, some friend groups Mm-hmm. down and so that students are connecting with people they wouldn't usually connect with um so yeah i, I would think about some of those things i'm thinking about the kind of theological reasons yeah and, and I, th- I think you're right i mean there's so much you just said that and maybe we'll come back kind of to the the clicks that we can kind of break up through games and be intentional about that but 
you know, as we think about it, like all the LGBTQ issues in our culture, um, it has forced the church to be more intentional in our theology about the body that you're bringing up. And, and I feel like kind of a reaction to so much that's out there in the culture has been some good literature. Like I'm thinking of Nancy Piercy's book. I'm thinking of Sam Albury's book. Um, uh, yeah, it just getting us to think more about, uh, the body. Uh, so yeah, I think that's, that's a good word. Uh, Scott, any, any theological thoughts to, to add to this? Um, yeah, I mean, I think just the, the idea of, uh, of God's people enjoying kind of God's creation, um, you know, and that, I think that would include games and our bodies and running around and things like that. And so just the, the celebratory nature of, even the old Testament, you know, there's feasts where people are getting together and they're, they're feasting and enjoying, um, fellowship and enjoying the Lord. And, um, so yeah, I think that's kind of where my mind goes. I haven't thought much about the, uh, theological, uh, reasons for games, but that's where my mind goes. Um, I think there is precedent in the Bible that the Christian should have fun and, you know, really we should be the people that have the most fun because we don't have the condemnation of God hanging over our head. And so we actually can enjoy life. Um, Mm -hmm. And so like we tell our students, there's three things we want our youth group to be. We want it to be fun, welcoming, and serious. Uh, And Mm -hmm. so that fun part is where we get the, you know, games and just play. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And quick sidebar for our listeners: uh, Scott had twenty minutes um, to prepare for this, so um, <laughs> just to, uh, to I also did not utilize that twenty minutes to prepare. I just I was doing other <laughs> stuff. <laughs> well, yeah, I just completely interrupted you your, your day and asked if you could jump on because um, let's let's just say uh, Kurt Cooper was going to be on here. He had something he forgot about, so not throwing Kurt under the bus, but yeah, um, we are. Yes, <laughs> he would throw us under the bus. That that is very true. Yeah, that is very true. Um, so he kind of inspired this, uh, you know, talking about games a little bit more. So anyway, just to, to throw that out. And I say that not to say that wasn't a good answer, Scott, like you were ill-prepared or anything, um, just to, to let everybody know that. Um, but th- that is something, you, you know, that I know we, we've talked about a little bit on uh, in this topic of games is, you know, thinking about creation and thinking about, you know, Adam and Eve pre-fall. Um, surely there was, you know, some type of, you know, playing games. Um, and then we think of just kind of the word recreation. Um, you know, do, do you guys think we're, we're going to play games in the new heavens and the new earth? Scott, you first. Yeah, I think so. Um, I don't know what that, I was talking to a student the other day about that, what that'll look like. Like if, if we play golf in heaven, you know, is everybody just going to be a hole in one? <laughs> yeah. Is it just going to be a mate? Like mm. that seems pretty boring if you can't improve and get better. Uh, so it'll be interesting. I don't know, but I think there will be games and it'll be awesome to have games without like sinful competitive pride, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Let Linda, what do you think? I am racking my brain for there was some, I think, podcast I listened to recently that I cannot think of what it was that I really want to say the person brought up a verse where it was picturing kind of the new heavens and new earth and talking about how the children were like playing in the streets or something. That was this podcast. It was it? Okay. Yeah. So it was Joe Deegan talked about that and the essentials. Yeah. I think it was in Ze- Zechariah. Um, yeah. There you go. I listen to so many things that I'm like, I don't know if it was this. I don't know if it was a counseling related podcast. Like, mm-hmm. okay, cool. Yeah. It all, it all just kind of run, runs together for me sometimes. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's awesome to think about that. I think it was, uh, Donald McLeod in his book of faith to live by talked about just kind of our glorified bodies and the athleticism undreamed of that we will be able to participate in. Um, so yeah, but but Scott, you bring up kind of a you know what are, are we just going to be awesome at everything? And so um, yeah, I don't know. It's it's interesting to to think about. I mean, you know, you think of like golf, for example, like you brought up. There's no frustration with it. Um, there's going to be you know no just heat. You know, the day would be like perfect weather. I guess you know I, I don't know. This is where yeah we've got to be careful maybe a little bit when we get kind of speculative here. But um but it's fun to think about. 
Yeah. Um, and, and to like the, the way that sports should operate on earth, which it doesn't, is every, you know, sports or games or whatever should be a means through which we worship the Lord. Like, mm -hmm. you know, when we play mm -hmm. games, you're like, man, God is good. And in heaven, it will be that, you know, if we are hitting a golf ball or playing cards or whatever it is, you know, that'll be a means through which we honor and glorify mm -hmm. the Lord and praise him. It won't be like we're just focused on the thing itself, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just think this conversation, I mean, how fun is it to, to bring something like this up to students and just get them to kind of engage what, what is it going to look like? And um, anyway, those have always been fruitful uh, conversations, uh, typically for, you know, if you're talking to junior high guys for maybe just a few minutes and then you've got to like steer it back on track. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about competition. Uh, you know, as we think about you just talking about how games should be, um, but yeah, we're playing post fall. Um, thoughts on that, Linda? Do you think uh, competition is a good thing? Um, yeah, just any kind of overall thoughts on competition. I don't know if this is something I've thought very deeply about or not, because there's definitely a way in which competition can, you know, even like school rivalries and how people just learn to. Um, hate the the school that their school is a rival with and we're trying to you know teach students not to think that way and not think oh just because they go to my rival school i don't like this person like no they're your brother and sister in christ um but there is something that can be healthy about competition when it's like actually i'm just really trying to be as good as i can be um at this thing that the Lord has enabled me to do and given me the gift of doing, um, you know, without it being so, um, like, like they're trying to put the other team or person down in, um, in the process. Um, I want to say that, um, there was a book I read, I'm going to have to find it on my bookshelf years ago, not the book that John wrote, but another book about sports, um, and like the potential of it for discipleship um that was talking about this sort of a thing um i think it's called in the arena yeah that's it yeah i was gonna get yeah uh -huh. yeah i don't remember um, that the author though uh it seems like it's david prince or price or something like that maybe um people can can google that scott what, what are some thoughts on uh competition uh my immediate thought, I went straight to uh, senior high Florida week two, uh, all those guys playing basketball, you know, <laughs> there's always on every team, there's people who get angry mm -hmm. and it, and it's all, it always goes back to pride. You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's they don't want this person to be better than them. And, uh, and so they get angry because their pride is attacked. So, yeah. So mm -hmm. I hate that part of competition where it, it is just a pride fueled, anger filled kind of thing but like linda said i think competition does push you to be better at, at what you're doing and so there's a good aspect of that like if you're playing basketball and not keeping score it's not as much fun because it's not pushing you and it doesn't matter you know mm -hmm. but um so i think i think it's good and bad mm -hmm. yeah yeah and it's funny i mean bringing up uh, some of the the pride that uh, you see at the basketball courts at RYM conferences or the Ultimate Frisbee or, or whatever. Um, oftentimes, youth workers are in the middle of that. <laughs> it's, that's uh, that's when it gets really hard to say, oh, wow, these aren't students that are fighting. <laughs> it's leaders. Say um, here for the uh, the youth workers, if you're playing in the, the basketball games, just just cool down, man. You're, yes. you know, you're older. Yeah. Just Just let it go. Just, yeah, a key thing, just walk away. I mean, if you can sense, like, I'm getting a little angry here, yeah, walk away. Um, now, I, I remember having this competition, I mean, this conversation about competition uh, with someone, and we were thinking, okay, is competition a result of the fall? Um, but I remember reading someone else who said, you know, to kind of think of it as like an iron sharpens iron, um, that we're both, you know, whatever the game is, it, you know, we're both agreeing to the rules of this game to say, okay, I'm going to try to beat you to the best of my ability. You're trying to beat me. We're both kind of in this together to sharpen each other. Um, and then, you know, obviously our sinful pride will get in the middle of that, but there are, you know, healthy aspects to competition. And, you know, it does make you think maybe in the new heavens and the new earth, we're going to have some competition that, you know, pride doesn't get in the way of that. Um, so it's fascinating to think about and um, trying to steward that, you know, this side of heaven 
um, is a challenge. And I think we need to have more conversations of what that can look like. And obviously as youth leaders, be talking to our students about that. I mean, there's, there are Linda kind of going back to what that author was saying. There's so many discipleship opportunities uh, through sports. Um, I'd like for us to talk a little bit about types of games. Um, what we've mentioned, you know, a lot, I, I just started jotting down some, some thoughts, um, right before this. So I haven't put a ton of thought into this. Uh, some of these are probably going to overlap, but y'all edit this, add to it, omit. Um, like I, I wrote down board games. That was the first thing that came to mind. Um, and I put more like athletic, you know, games that you can play. Uh, and then I kind of, these might all be together. Um, just trivia, academic, kind of intellectual type games. Um, but see, board games could kind of fit into that as well. You know, so you've got kind of the more intellectual type games, uh, games that are more team building, you know, which again can kind of incorporate both of those because, um, oftentimes you're doing team team building stuff. You're not focused on the athletic as much, you know, you you want games that everyone can be a part of, but sometimes these are like problem solving games. Um, and then I put card games. I thought they kind of maybe deserved a category of their own, even though again, they can be more intellectual and even team building, And then I just did uh, kind of like technology-based games um, because you've got video games, you've got, what is it, Game Pigeon um, that, you know, was popular for a while. I don't know if students are still playing it as much, Um, but things that involve some kind of a, you know, video game aspect to it. So, okay, board game, athletic, trivia, academic, intellectual, team building card, tech-based. What are... What are thoughts on that, kind of nuancing that, adding to that? Scott, Linda, well, who wants to jump in? Some thoughts on that? Yeah, I think there are a lot of different ways to kind of categorize games. Because one of the ways I think through it sometimes, too, is like, what are the games that are games that everyone participates in that I play in a gym or on a field versus everyone participates in it, but I can play in a smaller space, like four corners, you know, like my students, my middle school students legitimately will enjoy if we play four corners and then it's so simple, but it is not athletic at all. Um, you know, and then there's games that is more so, um, they're like, you just need a few volunteers to come up front on a stage while everybody else watches. Um, and there are some games that like, like board games, everyone could participate in it if you had a small crowd. Everyone couldn't participate in it if you get like 30 kids. Um, but, you know, and then even within some of those things, I think about, am I going to play a game that eliminates people f- over time or that everyone participates in the whole time? Because sometimes when I play those elimination games, then the more people get eliminated, the more I have this crowd of really distracting students who aren't yeah. even paying attention anymore. Um, yeah, so I don't know, I don't know what to call the games like, um, musical chairs or four corners or I don't, I don't know what to call that, yeah. um, as its own well, category. And, and jumping back to what you said, um, you know, where you've got a, a crowd before you're, you know, going to worship, you might bring some students up on stage. Well, we say those are kind of more entertainment style games to where it's just kind of, you know, everyone's just, again, they're just kind of laughing at it. They're, you know, I mean, we do that at RYM, you know, in large group, we'll bring just a handful of people up on stage and you've got, you know, 800 people out in the audience that we're not necessarily engaging, but there's a sense in which we are engaging them. So what would y'all say? Entertainment? Is that, is that good? Yeah, that's definitely one way. Like, I feel like I've always called it something like upfront games because you're bringing Mm -hmm. people up front. Um, But yeah, that's definitely another way to describe it. Okay. Scott, what about some some categories to add or modify a little bit? Gosh, I'm I'm so bad at games and stuff. I'm just not <laughs> a fun youth pastor. So that's why I have fun interns. Yes, you are. Stop it. But <laughs> um, I mean, I think that, that covers them all. Uh, I mean, I think maybe organized and not organized could be another category because mm-hmm. like we play a lot of, we've got a basketball goal and ping pong and we've got, um, you know, we've got a Wii where we play Mario Kart or Super Smash Bros or whatever. And um, those are just unorganized. It's just people kind of come and naturally gravitate towards those things. Um, mm-hmm. so I don't know if that would be a category. 
Yeah, like free play or something like that. I don't know. That's – yeah, uh, I like that. And, and I like too. I mean, yeah, I wonder what this would fall into. I can remember one time uh, I had – I'm just off the top of my head, maybe 10, give or take, junior high guys. And we were going to help help somebody move some furniture from their house. Well, we showed up, they weren't there, and we had to wait for 30, 45 minutes. Um, And I was thinking, what am I going to do with 10 (laughs) junior high students? And while we were waiting, we found maybe a tennis ball out in the yard. And we got the tennis ball and we started rolling it down the sidewalk and we started seeing, okay, who could roll it down the sidewalk farther without it falling off on either side of the sidewalk. And it just turned into a game and we started cheering and like whoever could get it farther. It was like that just turned into, and so I don't know if that kind of what you're saying, it's kind of like an unorganized game. It just was an invented kind of made up something. Um, but it, it was fun and it killed time. And, um, I think, you know, maybe that's kind of tapping into some of the, recreation aspect of just, you know, um, we're all together in that. We're all kind of cheering each other on and having fun. Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of games like that, that when you end up like at a camp or on a mission trip and you need to fill, fill time that we, I've done things like, um, signs or ninja or, um, uh, I just lost another one, but those things, it's just like, you can play for as long as you need to. Mm -hmm. And the students love it. Um, that feels a little bit different than any of the other categories we've put out there before. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. Those can be really helpful to have in your back pocket for moments like that. Yes. Yeah. And I'll throw this one out there too. Um, It does involve some props, but um, I remember we were at some kind of uh, junior high youth conference and um, there were a few times where, you know, you'd have to wait in line to do something. And the organizer of the event uh, brought two cinder blocks and rope and he would put it by the line and you'd get one student on one center block, one center on the other, and you'd both have a rope and you were trying to pull the other off of the center block. If you let go of the rope, you were out. Um, and it was just simple and it just passed the time. And so we put that in our youth room. I mean, you could buy a center block for a dollar and get some rope, um, get a smooth rope because you can tear your hands up if you're not careful. Um, that did happen. Um, but it's very cheap and we just put it in the corner of our youth room and students would play it every Wednesday night. Um, again, maybe five bucks on all of it you know, that you'd spend, but you know, you can carry a center block around, put it in the back of a van and, um, yeah, anyway, that's a, a fun game. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about some difficulties of some games. Uh, Linda, you mentioned earlier, you know, if you have games where students are getting eliminated, um, now all of a sudden you've got a crowd of students kind of over to the side. Um, you know, I'm thinking some of the things that come to mind, uh, you know, just learning curves. Sometimes you've got games where it can be hard to explain. And so you obviously want to have all the rules kind of bullet pointed where you can communicate them very clearly and students can, can, uh, you know, jump on quickly. Uh, think of attitudes. Um, that was always a challenge. You've got some students who are just, they don't want to be involved. And so you have to kind of force them. Um, you also have the fear aspect of, you know, somebody not wanting to, to get up and they don't want to be the one who fails and lets the team down. Um, Scott, Linda, what, what are some difficulties that come up from, from trying to do games? Yeah, I think the trying to include everybody is really difficult because it's not an athletic game. The athletic people are going to be bored. If it's, if it is an athletic game, the not athletic people are going to be terrified and embarrassed maybe. Um, so it, that, that's definitely a difficulty. Uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the first one that comes to mind because you've got people that, that want to do the game, I guess, no matter what game it is, you're going to have people that want to play and people that don't want to play. And so trying to get everybody on board to do it, it's tough. Linda, what are some thoughts on uh, difficulties? Right. I mean, I think that's probably the thing that comes to my mind the most too, is that especially if I'm doing a more active game, there are often a few students who don't want to play it and will just sit on the side by themselves. Um, and some, sometimes it's for reasons that I can't really do anything about. One time I had a student who had hyperhidrosis. Um, and so she just sweated more than usual. And so if it was a 
if it was a game where we were being really active or where we had to like hold hands with each other, like she was just worried about her hands being really like clammy. And so she, she just wouldn't participate. And, um, you know, in middle school, I'm not going to be like, no, I'm going to force you to do something. It's going to be really embarrassing to you. Mm -hmm. Um, so we just kind of had to work with that. Um, and something else I've had too is students like, the one or two students who will kind of purposely ruin the game for everybody <laughs> over and over because yes. um, they think it's funny. <laughs> it is sometimes. Yeah. It <laughs> right. It's funny at first. And then you're like, oh, wait, you keep doing this and we yeah. can't get this game going. Yeah. 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 But Scott, it takes skill Scott for them to do that often. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure Scott was that student back in the day. Um, no, you, you said, yeah, it, it takes skill for them to yeah, <laughs> mess it up. Um, it is so hard. I mean, there's always going to be challenges to it. Um, there are, you know, you, times where you do kind of have to enforce it and say, look, we're all going to do this. Um, but like you said, and, and Linda, I'm glad you're bringing up that point. There are some behind the scenes issues that youth workers need to be aware of at times and be sensitive to that. If, you know, we're, we're trying to get everyone involved and trying to get everyone to play, but if a student's kind of persistent and I don't want to do it, okay, just back off. And maybe if you have a volunteer, Hey, you know, stick the volunteer with that student and just kind of hang out with them. And, and that's where maybe some elimination games can come in handy because then you get to have some of those students interact. Um, Scott and Linda, we're, we're about to, to start wrapping this up. Um, let's maybe bullet point some of the benefits. Um, you know, we've mentioned some of these kind of throughout because, yeah, there's going to be difficulties, but we do think it's worth doing this. Um, I mean, it's something I even thought of kind of in this conversation. You know, we talk about how youth ministry is a partnership with the parents, um, you know, I, I think oftentimes just as a parent, I can think, um, you know, I want my kids to, to be active and to do things, um, because it's, it's good and healthy for them. But then at the end of the day, it's like, Hey, I, I want them to, to go to bed and get rest. And it, you can get them to get some energy out because they've been sitting in a classroom all day long. I know many students have extracurriculars, but just thinking, Hey, it's a way where we can see it as kind of partnering with, with the parents trying to do something, you know, that's an activity uh, that does allow their students to kind of get some of that energy out. Um, I've jotted down just a few others, but Scott, what would you say is a benefit of, of playing games? So I think one of the biggest benefits is uh, for those students who maybe don't feel like they're a part of the group. Like we've kind of got some, some pockets of, you know, two or three girls here and there and they don't really mix. And so a game is a good way to, to kind of get them to mix. It's kind of forced interaction into it. I think when they are sitting there by themselves, it just feels awkward and, and stuff. And so that gets them up and gets them busy and uh, can really help, I guess, integrate them into the, the rest of the group. Um, so I think that's part of it is the, the connection of it, but also the, like when students walk in and there's a game to, to play or there's a game being played, there's not that awkwardness and that kind of, don't know what to do with my hands kind of moment. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think those would probably be the, the most beneficial reasons. Yeah, that that's good. Linda, what, what are some, some benefits you can think of? Um, I mean, I think it, if you're putting the games before um, your lesson, especially it can help the students to be more engaged because they've gotten some of the energy out, especially if you're meeting in the middle of the week, like on a Wednesday and they've been sitting in class all day. Um, like there really is something to that aspect of them doing something with their bodies, I think that will help them. Um, and then like, just there's a sense in which relationships can be helped um, through games, especially if we're, um, I think if we're intentional about sometimes the teams that we form, um, like, you know, I, I often will let students, if I'm going to form a large team for um, a game, I might say like, hey, grab one friend that you're a partner with to make sure they have someone they're comfortable with on the team. But then we might mix it up to get people together who wouldn't usually be on a team. Um, and that that can help break down some of the um, clicks. Um, it also can be helpful if, your varying games that don't just cater to the athletic kids every week, but there's the other kind of games put in. So everyone kind of has their moment to shine. Um, I actually remember years ago, um, the first youth group I worked at, we, for our high school, like youth group program would do these, uh, 
upfront games because it there is it didn't make sense for us to do participatory games for as many high school students as we got. And I don't think they wouldn't have enjoyed it as much anyway, but it was one of those moments where I think we, we specifically had in mind a few students we wanted to bring forward for this game and they were competing against each other. And maybe like three things that one had to do with trivia and one was some, but then it ended with like a dance off or something. And we brought up this kid that was like kind of dorky, quiet, like whatever. And when it got to the dance part, like, he just busted like stuff out that we like had no idea was going to happen. And the whole crowd went wild. And I was in the back with like another one of our staff people. And it was just one of those moments where we looked at each other and we were like, this is one of those moments where the dorky kid becomes the hero and we love it. So it, yeah, it's just like every now and then you get those moments where like the, the students who aren't usually championed in their schools and in other settings, they can be championed um, in the youth group setting, depending on what kind of games you're playing. And that, that can be pretty awesome. Yeah. And I, I think it's, you know, that that's an echo of Eden to get to kind of borrow the, the title from Jerem Barr's book that we get that taste of heaven through games. And um, yeah, that was one, one thought I had of just, sometimes you do have those students who, you know, don't have the athletic success and aren't cheered from the stands where they get to do something like that and they get to book, become the hero. And that's always just, a fun thing when that, that happens. Um, look, there's, there's more that we can talk about and I know for sure we'll revisit this conversation on games because there is so much to this. Uh, but I know we need to wrap up. Look, Scott, Linda, really appreciate y'all both uh, being willing to have this conversation and Scott, especially jumping on very last minute. Uh, appreciate you both. Oh, come and buy without money. Oh, come and feast without